This podcast was made in partnership with the Flues app. The Flues marketing team is open to working with small creator channels, and I have personally made more than $700 through Flues' cashback and referral programs in just a few weeks. Would you be interested in a paid collaboration with Flues? If so, step one, download the app via my referral code, GeoBreeze Travel, and get three vouchers to earn up to 35% cash back on merchants such as CVS, Uber Eats, DoorDash, and more. And then step two, send me an email at julia at geobreezetravel.com, letting me know that you would be interested in hosting a paid giveaway, and I will introduce you to the Flues marketing team. Welcome to the GeoBreeze Travel Podcast, a show for anyone wanting to level up their travel hacking lifestyle. I'm your host, Julia Menez. I'm a travel hacker, coach, speaker, Filipina American ENTJ who loves solid travel gear and using shortcuts on spreadsheets. On this show, I'm on a mission to bring you travel hackers from all walks of life to help you level up your travel hacking game. We dive into credit cards, miles, points, strategy, mindset, and the secrets behind how to travel the world for next to no cost. So let's get hacking. Awesome. Pretty much every uh, site in the points and miles world lost probably 90 to 95% of their revenue virtually overnight as the banks all just locked up and, and froze up as they tried to assess what was going on with the, the onset of a pandemic. They pulled pretty much all products in a very short time frame from the affiliate space because they were rightfully concerned about the effects that the pandemic was going to have with, with the lockdown and just all the different moving parts that were going through this, what that was going to have on the individual consumer. And as we kind of saw you know, flashbacks of what might happen similar to 2008, where not be able to pay their bills, you know, get behind on their mortgage. You know, this time last year, really, they had no idea what was, what was going to happen. Um, and so they were not terribly incentivized to, to have people open cards that you know, in their purview might necessarily, not necessarily be able to pay the bill. And they would be kind of stuck uh, footing the bill. Hello, points people. You just heard a quote from Matt Brown, CEO of Mile Value. According to his Instagram, Matt is also a web developer, wood building junkie, and drone enthusiast who is addicted to golf possibly more so than points and miles. It's a close call. Matt also runs my personal affiliate links page, which you can find in the show notes. Just a reminder, never, ever, ever just Google a credit card and apply from there. Always use somebody's referral link or affiliate link so that the banks have to pay out commissions to the people who told you about their cards. And if you are interested in getting affiliate links of your own, check out milevalue.com slash affiliate program, which you can find in the show notes. In today's episode, Matt and I discuss how do these affiliate programs even work? How can you get started with credit card affiliate links if you are a small points and mouse content creator? And also a short history about how companies like 10x Travel are forced to adapt when banks sometimes just shut down affiliate programs like they did this last year. And now on with the show. Hey, Matt, welcome to the GeoBreeze Travel Podcast. Hey, Julia. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Thank you for recording with me. Again, this is our second time recording because the first time was many, many months ago and a lot of things have changed in the world of travel hacking. And also the sound got weird by the end of the recording. So this is our second recording. Thank you for hopping on again. So before we jump into everything that is mile value, tell us a little bit about how you got started with the world of points and miles. So I have kind of two stories with how I got started in points and miles. I grew up and my dad traveled a lot, was in sales and just inevitably had flew almost exclusively on US Air, which later became American Airlines and traveled and, and stayed mostly at Marriott hotels. So inevitably a couple times a year, he would cash in those points and we would go on family trips flying US Air and staying at Marriott Points. We had a fun, couple of fun big trips uh, to Europe here domestically uh, growing up. That was kind of the, the first in foray into the points and miles world. But I was just going on fun trips. I didn't really focus or care about you know, how they were made possible. So my sort of second uh, foray or more recent one, I got suckered in by a Facebook ad, I guess you could say. I had just graduated college and you know, was I guess, actively using Facebook. And for whatever reason, I, I fit the dynamics and the, the metrics that some of the ad parameters were set to. I saw an article about how some guy used points and miles to go on a $28,000 trip to Thailand for only about 300 bucks. I said, there's no way. This is a scam. There's no way this works. 
too good to be true. Gosh, you must have a terrible credit score. All these things. Of course, they were all wrong. I avoided the ad, but I kept coming. I kept coming. So I, I finally clicked on the article, and it was an article that Bryce Conway at 10X Travel had written. This was back in maybe 2015. And I walked through the whole nuts and bolts of of how he earned the points, how he redeemed them, all the things. And from that point on, I was hooked. So once you were hooked, what were some of the first cards that you started off with? Well, I had started, my first card I got late in college, maybe junior or senior year. And it was, well, I had a, a co- like a co-sign card with my dad that I got maybe senior year of high school or freshman year. I had you know, probably a thousand dollar credit limit. You know, just that the cliche kind of start. So as far as my first uh, on my own, I got was a BP gas card. You know, it was, I don't remember the specs, but it was something like three or 4%. I thought I was driving a lot in college to like my internships and all this stuff. So, hey, this would be a great way to get a little bit of a kickback. We all had to start somewhere. Yeah, no big deal, right? After that, I, I before I gotten into or, you know, seeing the Facebook ad, I did get, suckered into the capital one venture card you know march madness all the jennifer gardner commercials all those they got me yeah not a bad move i got a couple probably a thousand dollars or a couple hundred bucks at least out of the sign up bonuses i think it was probably a fifty thousand maybe not a hundred but um i used that card religiously put all my spend on it um, for a couple years but and then i I finally um, saw the article from bryce and, and got a chase sapphire preferred you know the the go-to starter card for so many of us in the points of miles world. And then the, the snowball started from there. So when you say the snowball, were you one of those people who were, who was opening five cards at a time, like 25 cards your first year? Did you just jump straight in or were you, what was the first year like when you first discovered points and miles? I definitely was cautiously optimistic about it as and took a very kind of slow and methodical approach. I still, wasn't quite sure it was legal or it wasn't going to ruin my credit score. I mean, you can always just trust things some guy on the internet says, right? So where I said it was fine. So I believed him and obviously you know, it all worked out just fine. But I, yeah, I don't, I don't remember the specifics, but I probably only did two or three cards that first year. I do have a business doing web design development. So I was able to also qualify for business cards as well. Um, so the combination of personal cards and business cards, I kind of slowly worked my way through, especially that first year. I definitely wasn't an Aparama type person, even though those were still kind of more freely available back in 2015, 2016 than they are now. But I definitely would do, I bet, I bet, I don't remember what year, maybe 2018 or something like that. I bet I did nine or 10 in a year. That was probably the most aggressive I got, but definitely not a, a, a mega sort of churner as some people used to do. What were one of the first trips that you were able to take using these points and miles once you had accumulated some your first year? So my wife and I went to Europe, went to London and Paris. We booked a, at the time it was about a $400 cash fare from our, my home airport here in North Carolina to London and then home from Paris. I want to say it was, a, yeah, about 400 bucks. And I, it, I used the remaining 80 or so thousand capital one points that I had had and just kind of hadn't hadn't finished off. Of course, this was before Capital One had transfer partners, so really the only use was was uh, you redeeming them for travel um, via cash, basically. So we got two tickets, just kind of I think it was Economy Plus, maybe nothing super fancy to Europe. And she had never been to Europe or to London or Paris at that time. I had been before, but we did just about two weeks. We stayed at the Churchill, is a Hyatt Regency in London. And it's awesome. Highly recommend. Super good value for anyone looking to use high points in London. We got upgraded to a pretty sweet, like two bedroom suite. I didn't really have any status or anything. Just, I guess, kind of won over the concierge and they were able to, to hook me up, which also gave us access to the lounge there, which was, it was actually a really nice lounge, but also saved us a ton of money just because food in general is expensive. So have a nice breakfast and then afternoon, happy hour and hors d'oeuvre, stuff like that. It was pretty nice. Then we went on to Paris and stayed at the Park Hyatt, which is kind of one of the, the landmark uh, properties, it seems, in, in Points of Miles, the Park Hyatt Paris Vendome. That was kind of cool. We, it's a funny story. We were only supposed to stay there for two nights. And I forget the breakdown, but we were staying at the Hyatt Madeleine for three or four nights. 
but we literally got there to check in and I guess there was some strike with the housekeeping staff. And so they said, literally, if we don't have enough rooms, we've gone ahead and moved you over to the Park Hyatt. Will that be okay? Yeah, and of course. <laughs> oh, sure. You know, twist my arm. So instead of two nights at the Park Hyatt, because I was being cheap and didn't want to you know, pay 30,000 points per night when I could have paid 20,000, we got, I think it was five or six nights there. So it worked out pretty well. So that was kind of a fun first uh, trip. That's an amazing first trip. So after that, what then was the path from this is a really cool hobby to I'm going to start working at 10x? What does that journey look like? Sure. So I, I, yeah, it's probably fifth, late 15, early 16. I don't remember the specifics on the dates, but I was an uh, active contributor in our Facebook group. When I joined, there was about a thousand people in the group. And so it was a real small community. You know, a lot of people got to know each other. You got to recognize familiar names and, and know people from a personal level. And it just kept growing and growing. Um, and so by about 2018 or so, I want to say we had maybe 25 or 30,000 people somewhere around there um, and just got to know Bryce really well and some of the other staff members and, and kind of showed that I guess I knew my stuff at that point. I developed a lot of knowledge here in a quick span of time, just based on my obsessive personality, I suppose. I, I don't ever do anything half speed. I definitely go 150 miles an hour on, on anything I do. And at that particular point in time, points of miles was, was what I had chosen to focus on. So there was some need on the team. I was also able to overlap my web design and, and development work as well to kind of some growing needs with the company as well and, and join the staff there in uh, 2017 or 2018. So you started off helping both with the web development side for the 10X doc. 10xtravel.com website, as well as writing articles for them? That's correct. And also helping people in our Facebook group as well. Cool. Were the articles that you were writing mostly credit card reviews? Were they trips that you were taking? How was that structured? A combination of, of all, really. It was, you know, if a new card was coming out, we would kind of cover it. And especially if a bonus change or things like that, it was also not necessarily as many trip reviews, although I've done a few just kind of showing people some of the, the possibilities with points and miles and what you can do. But also it was highlighting sweet spots, whether it's kind of the best ways to get to Europe or Australia or other destinations using a variety of different points and miles currencies and stacking those with award chart sweet spots to be able to kind of get the best bang for your buck. Um, that was that's a lot of what we focus on. But also it's you know, so and so on Rakuten is a hundred points per dollar today. You know, kind of newsy, more newsy type stuff as well. So it's really anything and everything that's going on in the points and miles world we can kind of cover. Nice. And since then, 10X has now a couple different branches of its brand, and you are the CEO of Mile Value. What is Mile Value versus 10X versus any of the other brands? How do you how do you differentiate those? Sure. So we acquired Mile Value in August of 2020. Um, Mile Value is pretty strong history in the points and miles world as a pretty well-respected publisher of, of some deep dive points and miles strategy as well. Not necessarily a news type site, but um, they've historically focused on more you know, literally getting the most value out of your miles as the brand kind of the name kind of indicates. So when we acquired them in August, I was given the task to be able to run that site. It's kind of the CEO, I guess, which I have to laugh because the title CEO makes it sound like it's some super corporate role uh, and this and that. But I guess at the end of the day, I am the decision maker there. So, so be it. I still work at 10X as well. So we kind of overlap. And it's it's interesting too, because some of our writers at 10X also write at Mile Value. And so there, there is overlap, but we also, they are separate entities and and we kind of have a little bit of different focus between the two companies. My value still continue to focus on producing really good content, not only around credit card uh, offers and new product changes, et cetera, but also continuing to focus on creating educational and informative content that really kind of breaks down the best redemption strategies for flights, hotels, and any kind of travel. Basically what my value has been doing all along. We're trying to just keep on that path, but also kick it up a notch a little bit. It's kind of been a unique circumstance since we acquired my value in August because we're still obviously in the depths of the pandemic. So literally 
a fraction of people are traveling or or were at the time still kind of you know it's we're we're seeing reduced travel but of course it's it's better now than it than it has been and, and seems to continue to trend upwards but even though we were you know, kind of relaunching the brand per se we've been trying to continue to create that content so that people could kind of stockpile some knowledge and learn different opportunities so that whenever they didn't feel more comfortable to be able to travel again uh, they would kind of have that knowledge and maybe have earned a particular currency or, or some sort of benefit during this sort of lull in in people's travel so that they could kind of get the best value for that miles once once they do try and kind of redeem or resume travel as we hopefully sort of look to exit this chaos that's been the last year or so pretty soon so so as the CEO of Mile Value, what are some of those key decisions that you have to make? And what are some of the strategic directions that you've had to lead the team on, especially given the pandemic and all of the interesting current events that have happened in Points and Miles this past year? So the, the biggest thing has been how to shape our content to be able to still teach Points and Miles knowledge, news, updates, whatever to people. Also knowing that very few people were actually putting that stuff into practice um, at the current time. So we didn't necessarily focus on if there was a award space that was, you know, if say Cathay Pacific award space in November of 2020, a huge availability we were found, you know, we probably, we weren't really going to post about stuff like that, just given the, the general climate at the time. So the biggest thing has been how to produce and develop content that's timeless but also relevant for people um, as well. And then, you know, it is a business. So at the end of the day too, we can only sustain things if, if, if we run it as a business. So trying to figure out where opportunities may be to kind of improve the business overall as well. So it's kind of mirroring and finding the, the happy balance between the content we produce to help our readers learn more and more and educate them, but then also as, as a business itself. Tell us a little bit more about the business side of this, because there's so much just free value on Mile Value. And as many points creators create, this podcast is free. All the blog content on Mile Value is free. How do you guys actually make money? Sure. So there are a couple of different avenues that we, and most, and a lot of uh, other similar properties do. The bulk of, of revenue is generated through affiliate links. There's very, very little hiding that. A number of different publications take different approaches to it. Our, our approach is, is we provide as much value and content and information to our readership free of charge, no, no uh, paywalls or, or anything like that, just as much as we can. And if you find our content valuable, we hope that you might kind of support us by applying for a new product when the time comes uh, through a link um, that we do obviously get paid for that. We don't try to push uh, affiliate links down people's throats or anything like that just you know if you find something valuable then kind of support the creator the, of that content that's the easiest thing you can do not only in in this space but also a number of different avenues online we've seen obviously affiliate marketing kind of grow grow and grow over the last couple of years so um, that should come to no surprise for a number of people yeah i've mentioned it on the podcast before but in case this is the first episode that you are listening to Please, please never just Google a card and apply from there. Every time you do, Matt dies a little bit inside or somebody else dies a little bit inside. Please never just Google a card. Always do your research on what's the best offer you can get and try to support like a friend's affiliate or a friend's referral link, a content creator's affiliate link. Don't just apply through Google. All right. So box done. No, you're 100% correct. I like to tell people friends don't let friends apply for credit cards directly on banks, websites, or in person, except in rare instances like we see with certain offers where if you're in branch, you might get like a way of annual fee or an extra perk. Obviously, in that case, it's whatever's the best value for the for the card holder or prospective card holder. But all things equal, support someone if you can. It literally costs you nothing. For sure. But even with all of the affiliate revenue, sometimes the credit card companies just like to say, we hate you, content creators, and we're taking away affiliate links for a little bit. So can you talk a little bit about what happened with affiliate links in, I think it was April of 2020, and how the business had to pivot given everything that was going on? 
So as far as, as how we had to pivot, I mean, we just kind of primarily at 10X because we didn't acquire mile value until, until August, but we kind of took the approach of, of keep providing as much content to our customers and our readership really as, as possible at the time. Obviously, no one knew how long this pandemic was going to last. So we didn't, you know, if you, it's funny if you know, it's kind of a side note right now, you're watching some TV shows where that are where, where basically filmed this time last year as people were kind of really getting into the pandemic. And I have to chuckle because a lot of times you hear them talking about, well, if we can just get through these two weeks or the next month or two, you know, that's, initially that's what everybody was thinking and where we were all wrong. But um, at the time we didn't know how long things were going to last. So we were going to kind of just keep on carrying on as business as usual, as much as possible to kind of keep providing the value for our readers um, as much as possible. So, And during those few months, it was all just a labor of love because you guys would have the, please use our links for nothing. We don't actually make money off of these links. Please just stay in the habit of using our links. So what was kind of the business strategy talks going on? with you and Bryce and everybody else then of, hey, how are we going to make money since we're not making money through links and we have to run it as a business? I think at a minimum, we were going to just try and last as long as we could. Literally, we didn't know if this was going to be a two-week thing, like some people were forecasting or two years or two months, whatever. So it was kind of keep on as we could. And, and you know, for if, if this is it, we're going to go out swinging. So we, we've really had to kind of fly by the seat of our pants a little bit and just sort of figure things out as, as we went along, just because, yeah, we, everything was, was very quick and overnight, but um, obviously we wanted to keep providing valuable content to our readers. So no, no, no pure strategy other than just figure it out as we go and see what happens. Yeah. Kind of like with personal finance, that emergency fund really, really comes in handy. Exactly. Exactly. And similar with personal finance too, I think it's important to have multiple streams of income for a business as well as in personal finance. So I think you guys have multiple different models now going on with, and not just through affiliate links, but you guys do organized trips and you have, I don't know if it's a Patreon or something else. Can you talk through the different income streams that you have now to kind of hedge against what if this happens again? Yeah. So we... Kind of an interesting time, but we had were in rolled out on the 10x side of things a couple trips. People have been asking about those for years, and we were we were hesitant to do it, but we finally said, "Hey, you know, no time better than now." So we we booked a couple group, basically group trip to destinations like Greece, Bali, Iceland, New Zealand, the Galapagos for later late in 21, and then most are early 22. Obviously. We don't know what the world's going to look like uh, at that time of, um, for now, but we do have those as an option and a number of them have been uh, sold out. So a lot of people are, are excited to do that. So there's a, a new foray for us, but we're going to kind of approach it and, and see how that goes. We also have on the 10X Travel side, uh, 10X Travel Plus, which is kind of a, a membership type um, arrangement. Again, people, our, our readers have been asking for it for years, but you know we, we didn't want to, we were hesitant to get into it. But you know, people asked for it and finally felt like we kind of offered up an offering for them that would provide an, an, an immense amount of value for them, not just uh, some of them paying us for something. So a variety of things such as discounts on our award booking service. We do award space alerts for them, some different access to exclusive sort of happy hours, kind of events that we'll throw throughout the year. Again, some of it kind of depends on how the next few months sort of unwind from COVID as well. But we have a big meetup every year. Historically, it's been in Vegas. We're still, we obviously had to cancel for 2020, but we'll see. I don't, I'm not sure if it'll happen in 21, but the next one it does, those members get sort of guaranteed tickets to that as well. So it's been a group of 75 or 80,000 people, which we'll, we'll shortly be at. I think last year we had only a hundred people go to the Vegas thing. So it was a very sought after um, spot. So for a few people to kind of get guaranteed access to that was a, a perk that a lot of people are excited about. And then over on the mile value side, we um, also have a war booking service that we um, do. And it's been exciting because it, it definitely have seen a nice uptick on uh, inquiries over the last couple months, uh, last maybe 45 or 60 days, which is exciting because it, it sort of reflects the notion that people are, are booking travel again. So that's exciting. And so that helps kind of as well. And on the mile value side too, you also have your affiliate program for 
people like me who have a small following, but maybe want to also get into the world of affiliate card sales. Can you talk a little bit about your affiliate program? Sure. So yes, we do have an affiliate program where we work with a number of different content creators and publishers to offer them access to affiliate links for credit card products. The requirements, especially now as we sort of exit post-COVID or still working through it, but the issuers are have tightened and tightened up even more on what some of the requirements are in order to to have paid affiliate links. So it's it's even more and more challenging, especially in the case of, of small to medium-sized content creators uh, to be able to get um, access to links. Um, so if you are a small uh, content creator, you you can get links through us. We do offer a program, as you mentioned, to where you can not only max out your, your Hyatt or Chase Sapphire preferred personal referrals a year with points, you can potentially look to uh, earn money in, in the, for those commissions on those approvals as well through our affiliate program. And I love this program because without it, I would have zero way of getting my own links through any of these banks. I'm like, hey, I have a podcast, like 500 people listen to it a week. That's definitely not enough volume to get your own links through this page. So I like that it kind of democratizes the world of points and miles where it's not just the same 12 blogs over and over again that can make money through affiliate links. It kind of spreads it to a whole bunch of other content creators, which I love because I like promoting all those content creators through this podcast. And I feel like mile value is a really good way to help all of them monetize too. What are some of the requirements that if somebody is listening right now being like, I want links, I want to monetize my Instagram where I kind of talk about some points and miles trips. What are the requirements for somebody to apply for the affiliate program that you run? Well, first of all, I couldn't have explained the program any better than you did. So I might have to see if there's an opening on our sales team to see if you're interested. So well done. Thank as you. far as requirements, yeah. As far as requirements, it's a, a little bit of a moving target. If you just have an Instagram page with a couple hundred followers, probably not a, not necessarily. If you have a website, um, that's a little bit more what, what we would be interested in. There's a little bit of a kind of a case-by-case basis, but you definitely do have to have certain content type, not only how much you publish, but also what you publish. So it's, it's, there's not a, you have to have this, 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 and this type thing, but you know, primarily if, if you're publishing points and miles content to a website, I'd love to chat. Hey there. Are you interested in getting access to the recordings of my monthly masterclass hangouts where we do deep dives into different travel hacking programs? If so, please check out the Patreon at patreon.com slash travel. Patreon members will also get to vote on the charity of the month because in case you didn't already know, all of the GeoBreeze travel income gets earmarked for donations to different nonprofits. That includes the income from the monthly hangouts, coaching services, and credit card affiliate signups. Links to all of those are available in the show notes. This week's Patreon shout out goes out to Elsa. Thank you so much for being a part of the GeoBreeze travel Patreon community. So jumping back to more of the personal side instead of the business side, you your day job is you're a web developer and then you also do the CEO thing for mile value. What's your favorite ways to earn points and miles just in your daily life? So I have kind of two options for earning points, obviously, is not only just personal spend. So, you know, my wife and I as we as we buy things, which seems to always be more than we really should. We try to optimize transactions as we can. So whether it's shopping through a portal, using a tool like cashback monitor kind of see what the best option is for any sort of online portal or maybe an in-store pickup by shopping online or just simply maximizing the card choice based on what we anticipate that certain retailer to code as. That's the easiest way. It's just kind of optimizing daily spend. It's also the hardest way. You're not, you know, sure, it's great that you get four points per dollar at the MX Gold, which really can add up quickly. But if you're going to redeem for a one-way flight on say British Airways, it's going to require 9,000 obvious, you know, based on the band. I think that's the minimum here in the U S domestically, that's still 9,000 points. So that requires you know, 2,500 bucks, give or take, you know, $2,200 of spend. That takes you know, a lot of spend just to be able to get that, but also it's a great reward on that spend. So a combination of optimizing your everyday spend, but also strategically using card bonuses should come as no surprise here to anyone kind of in the points of miles game, no matter where you are on the journey, but but realistically, you can never you can never spend your way to the same sort of return on spend you'll get from a sign on bonus from a new product in almost all scenarios. So both business and personally, it's a combination of of everyday spend, but then you know, strategically using 
sign on bonuses. On my business side, I am able to make basically make purchases in certain scenarios on behalf of clients. So whether my favorite one is every time, every couple of years, uh, every t- couple of times every year, GoDaddy seems to um, be a, a promoted or a bonus category on the British Airways Avio shopping portal. I live an hour from Charlotte, which is a one world, American Airlines one world hub, which means British Airways Avio is really shine there on nonstop flights. So I use this quite a bit, but they uh, end up being about 30 points per dollar on the GoDaddy, on GoDaddy spend through the British Airways shopping portal. So I simply strategically time my uh, renewals on like do things like domain names for clients, you get 30 points per dollar. You know, it's, often a couple thousand dollars worth of transaction, earn a lot of points really quickly that way. So I don't go overboard and really make sure that every time I swipe my card, it has to be the best card. I just kind of paying attention to it. They can really kind of add up. What are some of the cards you've opened more recently that you've been working towards minimum spend on? I just finished up Amex Business Platinum 100K offer. It's kind of a weird story. I got it basically this time last year for the 100000 and obviously not a great time of year uh, or great time given the pandemic to, to have a platinum if you want to use the Centurion Lounge or a few other features that card offers. But Amex quickly pivoted and made that card super worthwhile with the introduction of a bunch of credits, doubling the Dell credit, a few other things to be able to really get more outsized value, the combination of bonuses, but also Amex offers than the annual fee. So I got exponentially more value out of that card than the annual fee that I paid. So I was pretty happy with that even if I still haven't been able to use it in the Centurion Lounge just yet, but hopefully soon. But since my renewal date came up a couple of weeks ago, I chatted Amex and said, hey, you know, this card's 595 bucks. I haven't, yes, I've used some of the sum perks, but you know, I didn't get to really maximize it. Do you have any offers for me? Oh, sure. How about uh, we waive the annual fee for the next year? Okay, perfect. So they gave me a $595 statement credit, which offset the annual fee for another year. Oh, and I just happened to have a targeted offer in my Amex account for another business platinum for a hundred thousand points. Makes no sense to me, but it had, uh, I was eligible for it. So I applied for it and now I have two platinums for the price of one, I guess you could say. So you can have more than one Amex business platinum at the same time. That's correct. And you can have more than one Amex platinum, Amex gold, some things like that. The restriction is usually in the, in the signup bonus. You have to look for, or depending on you know, how you're targeted or whatever, they'll have language as to whether you're eligible for the product or not based on uh, when you last opened the card and earned the bonus. But they often waive that for particular customers, depending on maybe your spend habits or you know, a number of different criteria that they don't necessarily publish as to how you can get offers that don't have that sort of lifetime language. I got lucky, I think. What is the advantage of having more than one? business platinum card? There's really no, there's very little benefit other than some of the credits you get basically twice. So for me, I buy a lot of laptops and technology supplies for some of my customers. And so I can easily take advantage of the Dell credit. It's a hundred bucks every six months normally. In 2020, it was doubled to 200. So 400 for the calendar year. But in this year, at least as of now, I don't anticipate that changing anytime soon. You know, I paid 595 bucks for the annual fee, you know, obviously got the 100K sign-up bonus, but I'll get probably $200 just with the Dell credit alone, knocking the annual fee down to 395 A number of different other travel credits and, or, and Amex offers will probably pop up as well. And so I can all but rest assured that I'll probably get most of that $595 annual fee back or close to it in, in value, especially if we can start traveling more regularly to be able to utilize things like the Centurion Lounge, things like that. That makes sense. I was thinking about my personal Amex card and thinking, how many Saks credits do I really need? And how much Uber Eats do I really need each month? But if you're getting a lot of Dell credits and buying a lot of laptops, that makes a lot more sense. Cool. Is there a trip that you're planning for when everything opens back up in the world? Well, we just uh, booked last week. We uh, finally got our second vaccine a couple weeks ago. So we just booked uh, a trip back to Turks and Caicos for early June. It's kind of our, our favorite spot in the Caribbean. And so I'm looking forward to getting there. Just get out of the house for once, but also, you know, hopefully going to be a little bit back to normalcy. 
it's a it's a fun destination for us. We've probably been, I think, five or six times. I kind of lost track. It sounds very first world problem, I know. But from Charlotte, there's a number of uh, direct American Airlines flights to a number of islands in the Caribbean. So I mentioned earlier how Alberta Service Obvious really shines. Turks and Caicos is inside, I don't even remember the award chart, but whatever the band is where it's 9,000 points one way per person, they're literally, they meet that that zone by like 40 miles or something. So it's, you know, the cash prices on these round trip tickets in most cases are anywhere from 800 to a thousand dollars plus for an economy flight, but you can book the same flight for 18,000 British Airways Obvious round trip per person. So if you're somebody that loves to stretch your cents per point, that's a pretty good redemption and one we've taken advantage of a number of times. So doing the same here in uh, early June and, and looking forward to it. That sounds amazing. What hotel property are you staying at down there? We're staying at a small little local boutique place. It's called Royal West Indies. It's by no means a Ritz Carlton, although they are just about to open or have just opened a Ritz Carlton there. So there's an Andes that's also opening as well. So they're, Turks is finally kind of getting into a couple more mainstream, albeit luxury brands, but you know, fear not, points and miles people, you'll have a few more uh, redemption opportunities here very short. And they're you know, Turks has obviously been hit pretty hard by the pandemic as many places. So there's some really good cash fares and, and hotels during the time we're going. It's also a little bit of the off season during a normal year for them, but the weather's still perfect. So just uh, paying cash for the hotel, but saving a bunch on the flights. That sounds great. All right. And as we are wrapping up here, if you had to sum up all of your points and miles advice into one quote card, what would you like to say on that quote card? I would say that points and miles looks different from everyone, whether it's a free weekend in Fargo or a week long stay in the Maldives, as far as literally probably opposite ends of the travel spectrum. It literally looks different no matter, you know, because if you're a family of six, it's making this trip work because you've opened up a Sapphire Preferred and saved a thousand bucks and to make your weekend trip happen, or you allegedly got $60,000 worth of free travel by going to the Maldives. The point is, is that people are making travel experiences happen and making them work for their particular situation. They may be taking some or all of the financial constraints out of the picture. And to me, that's what's most exciting and and rewarding and beneficial to see of people using points of miles. Sounds great. And so we like to do shout outs on the show. So if you could recommend one other points of miles person that other people go follow on Instagram for points content, who would you like to recommend? I had to pick one person. I would definitely have to say Bryce Conway, the CEO at 10X Travel, my boss. No, I'm not trying to just get a raise, but he's super knowledgeable and funny guy and and runs an incredible community that we have at 10X. So if you're not, if you're into points and miles and and looking for a community feel, obviously there's a number of of people on like Instagram and stuff that really harbor that feel, but um, we've got a pretty, pretty awesome thing in our Facebook group that that he helps run that I would, would invite anyone to join. Perfect. And where can we find you on the internet? Well, you can find me primarily at 10xtravel.com and milevalue.com. I am on Instagram. I don't really use it, but on Instagram, I'm DMAT Brown. So say hello. I'm happy to chat. Sounds good. Well, thanks so much, Matt, for coming on to the show today. We have learned so much about affiliate links and all sorts of other cool things in points and miles today. So thank you for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Happy travels. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode of the GeoBreeze Travel Podcast. If any of the cards mentioned in today's episode piqued your interest, please check out the links in the show notes for more information on any of the cards. Also, if you apply for a card using the links on that page, I may receive a commission too, so please and thank you. P.S. I hear the links work better in Internet Explorer or Safari, and sometimes the credit card applications tend to glitch out in Chrome. Additionally, it would mean the world to me if you could subscribe to this podcast leave a five-star review, and share it with a friend. And if you would like to make even more travel hacking friends, please sign up for the Patreon to access our monthly Masterclass Hangouts. We dive deep into a particular points program each month, and you'll get to ask all of your travel hacking questions and enjoy being around other people who enjoy points and miles just as much as you and I do. If you would like an invite to the next one, head over to geobreezetravel.com hangouts to sign up to be on the invite list. Take care and happy travels!